I'm Andrew Jacob. I'm the curator at Sydney Observatory, which is part of the Powerhouse Museum. Tebbit was a dedicated astronomer. He came to the world's attention through his 1861 comet discovery and his relentless communication with the public and his colleagues. And he was considered by the public of New South Wales to be the premier astronomer in the state. In the period between about 1845 and 1855, when John Tebbit was getting involved in astronomy initially, developing his interest and starting his first observations, astronomy in New South Wales and Australia in general was in a bit of a lull. It wasn't until 1858, a lot later on, when Sydney Observatory was established, that astronomy in Australia really started to build up and become more popular and more activity was um, being undertaken. From the mid-1850s on, there was a growing interest in astronomy um, in Australia. And this was for two main reasons. One was the gold rush, which brought wealth and people into New South Wales. And the second was in a series of amazing astronomical events in the southern skies, bright, easy to see events like comets and Venus passing across the face of the sun. And these really generated a lot of public interest in astronomy. The Sydney Observatory was established in 1858 and it was built for the purpose of a time service, so a way of telling everybody the precise time. During the time when Tebbit was active, from about 1850s to 1916 or so, Sydney Observatory's work included the daily measurements and observations that went into establishing the time accurately and correctly, collating meteorological records from across New South Wales every day. But perhaps the single largest piece of work that the observatory was involved in was the Astrographic Catalogue Project. It was an international project designed to measure the brightness of every star on every photograph that was taken. Amateur observatories um, like Windsor and Tebbit could choose their own projects. They were completely free to do what they want as new objects appeared. They could do astronomy for its own sake. The government observatories had um, roles in timekeeping and meteorological recording that they had to do. They, um, they could do astronomical projects, and they did, but that astronomy was really in the service of commerce and good governance. Professional observatories like Sydney Observatory um, could call upon government funding, and they had several staff involved to do the work that they were required to do. On the other hand, amateur observatories like Tebbets could choose exactly what they wanted to do within their own funding. They could follow a new comet, um, change their observing program if they wanted. But Tebbit's observatory is uh, not really typical. It's probably the best equipped um, private observatory in the country. In 1862, Tebbit was the best qualified person in Australia to take on the work of the directorship of Sydney Observatory following the retirement of the first government astronomer, William Scott. He demonstrated his observing skills and his analytical skills. And he now had an international reputation following his discovery of the 1861 comet. We don't have his letters replying to Scott's offers of the position, but perhaps we can speculate about his reasons. He really valued his independence and he could see the effect that the work had had on Scott and he may have been aware of the difficulties of negotiating and dealing with the government bureaucracy. So as a young man, knowing that he would inherit the Peninsular Estate, I think he took the decision to remain independent and do his own thing. Henry Chamberlain Russell was born in West Maitland in 1836, just a couple of years after John Tebbit. He graduated from the University of Sydney straight into a role as computer at the observatory. Although he wasn't so strong at his work early on, he must have got better because in 1870 he became the government astronomer and maintained that role basically until his death in 1907. He was well connected, respected, hated by some. He received a parcel bomb from somebody. Um, but he probably, his time at the observatory was probably the most successful um, time that Sydney Observatory had. So Russell and Tebbit were almost the same age. They were born within two years of each other. 
Um, Tebbit came to astronomy from a young age as a boy. Russell came to astronomy when he graduated from the university and joined the observatory. The relationship began well, communicating, offering help to each other, but gradually soured. Um, the first real indication of that was when Russell deliberately left Tebbit out of a history that he was writing about astronomical and meteorological workers in New South Wales. Tebbit responded with a plea written to the newspapers for more astronomical work to be done at Sydney Observatory. He feared Sydney Observatory had moved too much into working on meteorology rather than astronomy. Um, pretty much at that point, the relationship failed. Apart from one or two terse letters, they never communicated again. So why did Tebbit and Russell end up with this dispute? It was clearly their personalities which led to it. Tebbit was a dedicated astronomer, very skilled. He taught himself the mathematics he needed for determining comet orbits. But he was almost fanatical about his astronomy. He measured the positions of stars, searched for comets, measured double stars, had a whole meteorology suite going. He'd record the weather all the time, every day. He ran a time service. These were all things that the Government Observer Observatory did. He was very concerned with his reputation. He would always defend his reputation. If anyone ever wrote anything or if he ever saw anything published, which seemed to miss the work that he'd done, he would always put the record straight. Fair enough. He'd done that work. He could put the record straight. But he was almost too strong about doing that. Russell was the government astronomer. He didn't have any observing experience when he came to the job. He learnt it on the job. It may be that Russell felt he was a slightly outclassed by Tebbit. Tebbit had been offered the position of government astronomer um, to replace Scott, who was Russell's superior. Russell shouldn't have been surprised by that. Uh, Tebbit was clearly the best qualified person at the time to do that. Um, and Russell moved into the job of government astronomer in 1870 in any case. He had a position to maintain. He was developing a reputation internationally as the government astronomer. He was connected uh, with, in government circles and in the circles of um, education and New South Wales society. Russell may have felt that his reputation was at stake. Tebbit was doing a lot of the work he was doing as well. They were almost competing at that. Tebbit seemed naturally a brilliant astronomer. Russell seemed to have to work a little harder to get his work done. Tebbit was fanatical about astronomy and kept to astronomy, really. He did meteorological work, but he really kept to the astronomy. And Tebbit thought the observatory should stick to the astronomy. And yet we know that the observatory was there as a government institution to provide the time service to work for the good of commerce and the public and governance of New South Wales. So Tebbit may have misunderstood somewhat the role of Russell, but Russell may have felt threatened by the reputation that Tebbit was gaining. Certainly in the public's eye, Tebbit was seen as the astronomer of New South Wales. So the contributions of Tebbit and Russell in particular um, were different in detail, but probably ultimately about the same impact on science and knowledge. Tebbit published over 400 papers, measured the positions of stars and comets and so on in the sky and discovered a few comets. Russell organised a transit of Venus expedition to four different sites and he photographed the entire southern sky. Perhaps the biggest difference between them would be that Tebbit's observatory ceased with the death of Tebbit. In Sydney Observatory, although Russell died, the observatory itself and its work continued on all the way through to 1983. John Tebbit was writing to the newspapers and publishing pamphlets, notifying the public about celestial events. He brought the grandeur of the universe to everyone's attention and provided context for those events. Sydney Observatory's daily time service ensured that goods and people could travel across the oceans safely, and his meteorological work was used by farmers across the state. And this work was less visible to the public, but it was vital to the state and the economy. And reading the newspapers of the day, there was commentary that Sydney Observatory wasn't pulling its weight astronomy-wise. 
But who's to say which is the more worthwhile contribution? Was it Sydney Observatory with its time service and its meteorological services? Or was Tevit having the greater effect on public information by publishing and writing to the newspapers about his discoveries and upcoming events? So in this whole debate about Tevit and Russell, and you should remember it's not really about Sydney Observatory versus Windsor. Both observatories were part of an extensive ecosystem of astronomical work in the late 1800s and beyond. Um, it was a time of new technology, a transition from the older astronomical work of positional astronomy towards a curiosity-led scientific discovery. And both Sydney Observatory and Windsor contributed to that astronomy, but differently, um, but worthwhile in their own ways. I think both warrant a place in history for their contributions to astronomy.